Hello, this is Ryan Ray of AAII. We are talking about the latest and greatest from the world of finance and investing for the individual investor. We're broadcasting, and if you're watching this in the archive, we do post our upcoming live show schedule on aaii.com slash webinars, and AAII members do have access to the full archive of shows. With me is my capable co-host and co-producer, Kyler Wirth. Hi, Kyler. Hi, happy to be here. Our guests today are Charles Roeplut, John Bykowski, and Brian Hawhey. Today's show has three topics. Which investments should you select for your portfolio? In the first segment of this episode of the Individual Investor Show, we discuss the process of choosing specific investments given your investing profile and goals as part of PRISM wealth building process. Next, we reveal the promising large cap growth mutual funds and exchange traded funds that have made our latest first cut list. Finally, we interview AAII Journal contributing editor Brian Hawhey about convertible bonds and their risk return trade-offs. Let's get started. Today, I am joined by Charles Roplett, who wrote the article, Populating Your Portfolio Based on Your Allocation and Preferences. Hello, Charles. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing, Kyler? Excellent. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, if you've been following along, Charles has been taking AAII members through the PRISM wealth building process. The five steps of PRISM help individual investors create a personalized plan that enables them to have the direction, discipline, and confidence to achieve their goals. The fourth step in this process involves selecting and managing investments. Could you review the pre previous three steps that support the individual investor as they come to this decision? Yeah, absolutely. So it's prioritizing your goals, recognizing your risk tolerance and asset allocation, um, and then identifying your investment management preferences. And so PRISM is a top-down approach. So these first three steps, knowing what your goals are, prioritizing them, recognizing your risk tolerance, and then determining the correct allocation for, the, for that level of risk and then identifying your investment management preferences, those three things drive your investment decisions. So it's not about what's the best stock, what is the best fund, it's what am I trying to do? What am I trying to accomplish? How much volatility can I withstand? And then what are my preferences? And that narrows down the universe. So there's more than 30,000 stocks, funds, ETFs, and we haven't even gotten into the thousands of bonds out there. So the idea of PRISM is what, Rather than looking through the whole haystack to find that needle, we're, no, we're actually narrowing it down to a barrel of hay, or bale of hay, I should say, where you have a much smaller universe to find that best investment that fits in with your portfolio strategy. Uh, let's get into it. How could a new investor best figure out which investing strategy works for them? How do they know what kind of investor they are? Is it trial and error? Now, absolutely not. We created a questionnaire that people can find in the May AI journal. Uh, it's also on our website at aii.com slash learn and plan, all one words, no space. Um, and it walks through investors' various scenarios and various questions. Uh, but a high level, it really comes down to your interest level, uh, your desire for assistance, and your constraints. Uh, for instance, you might fancy yourself as someone who hand selects all their investments. Uh, but you might be, say, in a 401k plan where you're forced to actually buy funds. So that would be a constraint. So you need to consider you know, what you're willing to do. Do you find researching stocks and bonds to be interesting? But also, what constraints do you have? And those constraints could be where you're investing. It could be your available time. Uh, but it could also be your knowledge or your comfort level with actually being in complete control of your investment decisions. So there are a combination of active and passive strategies here, depending on your investing profile and overall goals. How could an investor know when to use an active or passive strategy or a combination of both? Certainly, and it comes down to preferences. Uh, index investors tend to like the fact that index funds give your return close to the market averages or the, close to the indexes they follow. Uh, they, these index funds have low costs um, and low tax costs as well. Uh, they tend to be very tax efficient. Uh, so a lot of people take comfort in those levels. 
they might also look at the performance of active managers as a group over time, they do tend to underperform the broader indexes. Um, but active strategies are favored by those people who want the chance to be the indexes. And there are some index, sorry, there are some active managers who actually do beat the indexes over long periods of time. Uh, some people might also prefer active strategies for certain parts of the market or for certain investments. So for instance, you might be an index investor for the S&P 500, but when you're looking at say small cap value or perhaps you're looking at emerging markets or perhaps bonds, you might view those markets as being less efficient, meaning there's more securities in them that are mispriced. And you might think that gives active managers you know, a ability to outperform in those specific areas. So that does come down to preferences, but I do wanna emphasize constraints can play a role. You might have a preference for one for either active or for indexing, but you might be in a 401k plan. Uh, perhaps you're saving for kids or grandkids college through a 529 plan, uh, or perhaps you're in a health savings account where you only have either index funds or actively managed funds available to you. And so that case, you might have a preference for one style of investing, but you might have a constraint that forces you to consider a different type of fund. So there are a combination of active and passive strategies here, depending on your investing profile and overall goals. How would an investor know when to use an active or passive strategy or a combination of both? Well, it comes down to a few factors. One of them is your preference. So some people prefer active strategies because they believe active managers have the ability to outperform and they like having that ability or that chance of getting higher returns than they would get from tracking a major index. Other people prefer index funds because index funds tend to mimic the returns of an index. A well-defined index fund, such as one that tracks the S&P 500, will give you the return of the S&P 500 minus a little bit for expenses. And the expenses of index funds tend to be very low. Also, index funds tend to be very tax efficient. Now, and there are cases, however, where you might have a preference for active in some areas, and a preference for indexes in other areas. For instance, you might view index investing as favorable for larger parts of the market. Say, for instance, you're tracking the S&P 500. For large cap stocks, you might view index investing as being more preferential uh, because you believe it's harder for people to outperform. But then when you look at areas of investing, say emerging market stocks or perhaps bonds, you might think those markets are less efficiently priced, meaning that securities are more, tend to be more mispriced, and you might view that as giving active approaches more ability to outperform, so you could blend. There's also a factor of constraints. So if you're investing, say, in a 401k plan, uh, perhaps you're saving for a kid's or a grandchild's college education through a 529 plan, or perhaps you have a health savings account an HSA, you might be limited in your fund options, meaning you might prefer index or you might prefer active strategies, but the plan you're looking at only has index funds or only has active approaches. So it's so a few different things at play that really determine whether or not you're going to use active funds or you're going to use index funds. Are there benefits or things to consider when using a partially hands-on approach versus a fully hands-on approach? Absolutely. So fully hands-on approach means you're handpicking everything that goes into your portfolio, all the stocks and all the bonds if you're holding bonds. Now, if some people want to actually have a mix, so maybe they feel very comfortable picking domestic stocks, uh, but perhaps they're looking at international markets, maybe Europe, maybe Japan, or alternatively, they're looking at emerging markets, say Brazil, China, uh, we could go down the list. And so the question is, where's your comfort level? and Where does your scope of expertise end? So for instance, you might be very skilled at picking domestic stocks, but going beyond US borders, you have less ability, or perhaps when it comes to bonds, you don't have a large enough portfolio to build a diversified portfolio of bonds, or perhaps you don't feel as comfortable getting into things such as duration 
as credit quality. In that case, you might want to actually use a more, you might, want, you might want to use a professional, perhaps a fund or an ETF to allocate to those areas. Uh, so it really comes down to how involved you want to be and what are your limits, uh, both in terms of time, in terms of knowledge, in terms of do you want to hand some of that information off and bring someone up who has professional expertise to handle that part of your investment management process. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you for answering these questions. Sure, my pleasure, Kyler. Yes. Uh, for more information on the process of choosing specific investments, giving your investing profile and goals, look for the article titled Populating Your Portfolio Based on Your Allocation and Preferences in the June 2021 issue of the AAII Journal in print and online. Thank you once again, Charles. Hope you have a great day. You too. Today, I'm joined by John Bykowski, president and CEO of AAII and author of the article, Large Cap Growth Funds Performing Well Compared to Their Peers. How are you doing today, John? Doing great, thank you. All right, glad to have you here. Um, so John, for the two of our first cut lists this month, we took a look at domestic large cap growth stock mutual funds and ETFs that have performed well within their peer groups over the last five years. You wrote that domestic large cap stocks are a core asset allocation segment for most investors. Is that what you got? Is that what got you curious looking at these kind of investments? What was the inspiration for your first cut list in this category? Yeah, what we find again, if you're going to be uh, looking at building a long-term portfolio, uh, for for many people, you're going to start off with investing in U.S. equities, and uh, it makes a lot of sense to as your base, as your core to have investments in, in the, the largest, most stable companies in, in the United, traded in the United States. And uh, there's different avenues to pursue. You could simply pick an S&P 500 index fund, or if you want to, if you have a, a value bend, you believe uh, you want a little bit looking for stocks that are a little bit cheaper than other stocks, you might go on a value route. Or if you're looking for a little bit extra growth and not concerned so much about income, you may focus in on the growth segment. So in our previous uh, issue, we had focused on the value, large cap value stocks. And in this case, we wanted to take a look at the large cap growth stocks and, and the funds that hold them, both funds and ETFs. And it's very important when you look at any kind of, of fund and, and ETF, assuming you're not trading, you're assuming you're trying to build up a, a holding you can hold on for a long period of time. It's very important to look at how these funds compare against other funds in the same category. Uh, so for the, in terms of inspiration uh, for the, the large cap growth thing, we want to take a look at uh, funds that had performed well for the one, three, five year period uh, within other large cap growth funds. We wanted to make sure that the risk was not excessive. because so you could boost your performance by uh, leveraging, taking a lot of risk, trading frequently, uh, but then that might be repeatable and you may not be wanting to live with that kind of volatility if you have a market decline. And also expenses. Expenses are very important. Uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that you're not overpaying, uh, especially if you're investing in an index fund or a closet indexer. You want to make sure you're not paying too much in, in those expense fees because they'll really be a long drag on your performance long term. Uh, what are the advantages to investing in large company stocks over small company stocks generally? Yeah, again, I think there's room for both in your portfolio. We found that over, over the years, uh, they'll tend to move a little bit differently, so it adds to diversification. Uh, but what, what you're going to find with uh, the large cap stocks and large cap growth stocks is that uh, they'll be a little bit less volatile than, say, small caps. Uh, they'll be able to uh, withstand, they'll, they'll attract the resources so that if there's any kind of downturn in the market, uh, they're able to attract the resources to stay you know, solvent and grow and prosper. And lately, we've had a lot of large cap companies simply become larger. Uh, they've been, you know, they, they, they've been able to adapt very well to the new economy. Uh, a lot of these larger firms uh, actually thrived last year during the pandemic. Companies like Amazon were able to quit very quickly pivot and, 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 and service the needs of, of the economy as many people were basically sheltered in place. So these large companies have the resources, the energy, and very often they're global as well in their reach. So they're able to uh, push their products not only in the U.S. but throughout the world. So uh, the one advantage of having them as a core part of your portfolio 
is that you can build around it. So you, it's a very competitive marketplace. Um, you may not be able to easily analyze and make a choice one way versus the other, but having a mutual fund that focuses on large cap, large cap growth, large cap value in your portfolio will give you that strong core equity position that will help you build long-term wealth. Let's start with a mutual fund list. What were the metrics of your screen and how many funds did you find that met the criteria? Well, we, we focused really on uh, companies and funds in this case that outperformed their peers. Uh, we wanted to make sure that their, their, their one, three, five year performance was better than other funds in that same category. We wanted to make sure that their risk, their volatility uh, was not extreme and that their expense ratios uh, were also in line. They weren't too expensive relative to other large cap funds. And we wanted to make sure they're open to new investors and that they weren't really focused in on uh, the ultra rich uh, investors. So we wanted to make sure they're open and available and that minimum initial investments weren't too great. And um, let me take a quick look at the number here briefly. I think we had uh, somewhere around 29 funds, I think 23 funds passed uh, that particular list of, of mutual funds. And then we went ahead and had to rank them based upon their uh, performance. Um, and, you know, what we found is this fund, this list was filled with a lot of uh, NASDAQ focused companies. I mean, the, uh, in general, the, 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 the growth segment, large cap growth segment is filled with uh, technology focused funds or funds that have done really well. And Tesla's in there as well. So chances are, if you're holding on to a, a large cap growth fund, it'll have Apple, Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft, those kind of companies are gonna be prominently in there. And those are the big disruptors that we've had and um, they've done very well over the last 10 years. Uh, so you can have a lot of uh, exposure uh, to those types of firms in the list. Uh, one thing I noticed is that the funds on the list are spread over various fund families. Is there anything to keeping your investments within the family, so to speak, or and more broadly, what can you say about diversification and investing in these kinds of large cap growth funds? Well, it's what you're going to find in, in most cases is that almost every fund family, uh, unless they're relatively narrowly focused, will have some offerings in the large cap segment, large cap growth, large cap value. Uh, so what we found is we found quite a few funds that were uh, focused in this case, the, the top performing funds that passed were very much focused in on the NASDAQ index or, or, or the growth segment of the S&P 500. And chances are, you'll, if you want to be indexing, and it's certainly very fine to be indexing in a large cap arena, is, you know, you, your chances are you'll be able to find at least one or two large cap um, funds that are, are, are well priced as far as expense ratio within your fund family. So if you are working with a uh, 401k plan, you, you'll be more than likely be able to find an interesting candidate that fulfills that core part of your holding. So uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with, you know, uh, sticking with that part of your asset allocation with the larger cap stocks, and you'll probably find one within one of your fund families, be it Fidelity, Vanguard, or Invesco, T. Rowe Price. Let's turn to the ETF list. What metrics do you use to evaluate the ETFs here? And what were your findings for the first cut list? Yeah, the, the, the really we use the same type of criteria as we used for the funds. Our focus was on relative performance within the category, reasonable risk, uh, and expense ratios being within in, in reason as well. And we're avoiding leverage funds because a lot of these funds could have done very well by borrowing or, or using leverage to boost their returns, which works really well when the market's going up, but it certainly hurts you when the market's going down. And the risk there is always that you, the, the funds are down so much that uh, it kind of, uh, you lose your, 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 your discipline and your, your, your emotions take over and you sell at the wrong time. That's always a, a big risk. So we focused in on the same kind of factors, relative performance, and the same kinds of funds really pass the ETF side as, as on the mutual fund side. Uh, again, on, on the ETF side, these are all gonna be really index funds. On the fund side, open the mutual funds, we would have some actively managed funds in there as well. So if your preference is towards actively managed versus uh, e indexes, you have more choices on open-ended funds. If your goal is to be kind of low cost indexing, there's plenty of good choices on the ETF side. And we found basically the same kind of funds focused on the NASDAQ 
that passed large cap growth ETF as on the large cap growth fund listing. ETFs are a little bit different than mutual funds. What are your recommendations for investors who look to ETFs? Well, uh, again, it's it, the one thing that we found in comparing ETFs versus open-ended funds is they tend to be a little bit more tax efficient, uh, even within the same category. Uh, you're more likely, even if you hold a, an open-ended fund, if they've made portfolio transactions over time, you may be hit with a capital gains tax come year end. All of these are passed through instruments. Uh, so if they incur any capital gains or losses, they have to pass those on to their shareholders, which is, is you. And so typically speaking, uh, ETFs tend to be a little bit more efficient um, than and tax efficient than the open-ended funds. And when you're looking at ETFs, and we're looking at large cap uh, ETFs, we made sure that the trading volume was, was reasonable, that these are actively traded. You wanna make sure that the fund you're buying is have does have a lot of other investors has reasonable trading volume because there's a possibility then uh, that these funds may trade at a slight discount or premium uh, against their net asset value. So when you're buying an ETF, the one advantage is you could deal with your broker. You can go ahead and buy midday um, whenever you want to. Uh, and versus an op open-ended fund, you're going to be contacting the fund either directly or through your broker. And you'll be typically paying a dollar amount. And then at the end of the day, they'll calculate the NAV and give you the share amounts and the same work on the redemption side. So the key here is whether you're using, especially open-ended funds, um, you know, make sure you're not paying any kind of uh, commission as far as uh, sales charges, uh, keep your 12B1 fees low if, if, or, or minimal at best. So, cause you, if you're doing your own research, why do you want to pay a sales commission to someone else? And uh, I think that's always, you know, uh, when it comes to long-term investing, you know, it, it, these small expenses, the, these high expense ratios do a big long-term drag on your ultimate performance. So you want to keep your costs in check when you go ahead and make your investment decisions. My last question is about trends in ETFs. Looking at the ones that pass through all the filters, are they indicative of any trends that have occurred over the past year investors should look for? Yeah, I think the, the big trends probably is how well a lot of these uh, companies did during the um, pandemic. I think, you know, last year, uh, the stronger performing funds uh, were able to quickly adapt and, and serve the need of the customer uh, when they weren't able to necessarily go out and travel and things like that. Um, what we're seeing now this year is almost a reversal. So many of the, the categories that did very well last year are, are perhaps lagging this year. And so some of the categories, which is in some cases, some of the value categories, which are a little bit more focused on other segments, such as even financials are, are performing better in 2021 versus 2020. Uh, but what you're seeing within the uh, ETF universe or the fund uni universe is that, um, you know, the, the, these large cap funds have had a great long-term track record have had a great run over the last 10 years and they're, they're dominant companies in their industry and in the economy. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, John. It's been um, a pleasure. You, oh, thank you. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the first cut list John evaluated, find the mutual fund one titled large cap growth funds performing well compared to peers and the ETF one titled large cap growth ETF performing well to peers in the June, 2021, issue of the AAII Journal, available in print and online. Thank you once again. Hope you have a great day. Pleasure. Take care. With us today to talk about convertible bonds is Brian Hawhey, contributing editor to the AAII Journal and assistant professor of finance and director of the Investment Center at Marist College. Welcome to the program, Brian. Thanks, Ryan. It's good to be back. All right, so bonds, generally speaking, are fixed income instruments and tend to attract risk-averse investors who want interest and principal ahead of shareholders, but not all bonds are created equal. Brian, what exactly is a convertible bond? Well, so as you know, Ryan, a bond in effect is a loan and it pays interest regularly and returns principal on maturity. On the other hand, a common share reflects an ownership interest in the company. Um, it may or may not pay a dividend and it offers potential price appreciation, but of course it's more risky than a bond. So a convertible bond is a hybrid of the two. It blends some of the features of a bond and a stock. It acts just like a regular bond in that it pays interest, but it also has a special provision in that it can be converted into shares of the company. 
and those shares will be obtained at a predetermined fixed price. So convertible bonds, because of that, they appeal to investors who like the idea of owning shares in the company, but they believe that it might be too risky to own the shares outright. The convertible bond gives the investor what we call a call option on the shares. That is, it gives them the right, but not the obligation to convert those shares uh, into shares at a predetermined price. And we call that price the conversion price. So if the stock appreciates, the investor is able to surrender the bond and receive a fixed number of shares in return. And in so doing, they benefit from the share price appreciation. So what about if the stock price doesn't increase? Well, unlike with owning shares outright, if the share price doesn't appreciate or even falls, the investor will still get a positive return. He'll still continue to hold the bond and collect the coupon payments and, of course, receive his principal back at maturity. So if the stock price doesn't go up or if it falls, we call that a busted convertible. Uh, and that's when the stock price is so low that really the, the chance of the bond being converted is highly unlikely. And that cutoff is generally when the stock is trading at about 50% or so of, of the conversion price. So in a nutshell, the convertible bonds investors, they get the best of both worlds. They get the upside of the stock and they get the safety of a bond. So then uh, based off of what you just said, do all convertible bonds work the same way? It seems like there could be some, some trade-offs here. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, there, there can be nuances. So for example, some convertible bonds have what we call a contingent conversion feature. So that means they can only be exercised, the conversion uh, feature can only be exercised if the stock price rises above some trigger price. And of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Because the investor is getting that call option in addition to the bond, he has to pay for it. And so he or she does that by uh, accepting a lower coupon than they would otherwise get on a straight or a non-convertible bond. And of course, that's one reason why issuers tend to like these convertible bonds, because by issuing the lower coupon, they save on the interest expense. So in general, convertibles with features, or any type of bonds really, with features that benefit the investor, such as a put feature that allows the investor to uh, surrender the bond back and get his principal back. And he'll often do that if, if rates rise and bond prices drop. So a bond like that will carry a lower coupon relative to a, a plain vanilla bond. Whereas bonds that offer a feature that benefits the issuer, such as the right for the issuer to redeem the bond early, those will tend to carry a higher coupon. So now that you've described what a uh, convertible bond is and all the nuances, let, you know, let's talk performance. Uh, how might an investor go about using convertible bonds for long-term investing? Or is this you know, uh, perhaps a, an asset class or strategy that is, is to be avoided in bear markets? Uh, well, actually, that's a great question. And uh, history is really uh, interesting, as, as uh, I'll mention in a minute. So, so remember, these, these convertible bonds, they do offer coupons that are lower than regular bonds. But nevertheless, they're still extremely attractive, both in bear markets and then as we come, come out or emerge from a, from a bear market. So bonds in general are, are pretty attractive in recessions as opposed to stock. Stock can decline. But with bonds, when we emerge from a recession, interest rates typically rise. And so that can lead a bondholder to experience negative returns. Um, so convertible bonds, though, they tend to be shorter than most other corporate bonds. They tend to have a term of about five to seven years. So they're going to be less exposed to interest rate risk than other corporate bonds. So that's one advantage. But more particularly, the main attraction of convertible bonds is their potential for equity-like returns. So what happens is that during the downturn, the convertibles will act like bonds. You'll collect your coupon. But when the economy begins to recover, the underlying equity starts to appreciate, sometimes dramatically, as the economy expands. So that will drive up returns on the convertible bonds. Because again, remember, you're going to be able to convert into the equity if the stock price goes up. And in fact, convertibles are, are typically going to be issued by lower rated and more risky firms. And those are the types of companies that tend to perform best coming out of a recession. So how are they done? Well, if we look back at the previous bear markets, we can see that convertibles, they consistently perform really, really well. So if we look at 2000 and 2003, for instance, uh, just following the collapse of the dot-com bubble, an investor who was in the Calamus convertible fund, the ticker on that is CCVIX, he or she would have seen a total return of positive 22%. Now, that's in sharp contrast to an investor who is just in the, the general S&P 500 ETF, the SPY. 
they would have seen a negative 20% return. And an investor who is unfortunate enough to have been in technology in the NASDAQ 100 QQQ ETF, he would have seen a negative 60% return, total return over that period. And of course, it wasn't just the dot-com crisis uh, where we've seen the benefit of um, uh, the convertibles. So during the subprime crisis, the investor, if he was in the Calamus fund between 2008 and 2009, his total return would have been less than negative 1%, so just barely underwater. Whereas somebody who was in the S&P 500 ETF, he, would have had a, he or she would have had a negative return of negative 20%. And the QQQ investor would have had a negative 10% total return. Last year, uh, following from COVID, during the entire year of 2020, the Calamus investor would have earned 48%, crushing the S&P's total return of 18%. And even in the last 12 months, through or the 12 months through March of this year, the Calamus fund returned 58%. The Nasdaq uh, ETF did 53% and the S&P to 31%. So massive performance coming in from convertibles. And by the way, an interesting feature of convertibles is that even in a bull market, they can sometimes be worth more than the stock because imagine that you've got a stock that doesn't pay dividends or pays a very small dividend and the stock price goes up. So you're in this convertible bond, but you can wait before you convert into the stock and you can continue to benefit from the coupon that you're getting. So that coupon is gonna be more than the dividends you get and then after whatever period of time you want, you can convert that into the stock, sell the stock or continue to hold it. Uh, so you'll have outperformed the stock actually during that period. Uh, as you've discussed, there are some trade-offs with convertible bonds. And it, again, as you just laid out, it sounds like it could be potentially pretty lucrative. But what about the risks? You know, this, this seems a little bit like a sophisticated strategy, but, uh, but one that could potentially pay off for savvy investors. Yeah, I mean, you need to be a little bit careful. So as, as I mentioned, uh, because of their equity component, the convertibles can expose you to equity price risk. Uh, so as the underlying equity goes up, then the price of the convertible is going to go up as well, because the bond is really going to be treated like an equity substitute. In effect, what's happening is that the convertible is no longer priced as a bond, but rather it's been, its price will match the basket of stocks or the, the number of shares into which it can be converted. And that means that the convertible can trade uh, at a significant premium to its value as a regular bond. So for instance, in the article uh, in the journal this month, I give the example of a Tesla bond that was issued in 2019. So its price has fluctuated pretty dramatically along with the stock. It's down 40% from its peak in this past January, but it's still up threefold over the last 12 months. So you got that massive equity uh, appreciation, but a lot of volatility. But the problem is if you were to buy that bond right now or another uh, equity like convertible, then you face the risk that equity prices fall, dragging down the price of that bond. So you buy the bond at an expensive price, equities fall and the bond price gets dragged down. So to, to, um, uh, to take account of that risk, really investors looking at convertible bonds, if they're thinking about buying individual convertible bonds, they should really focus on recently issued bonds. So those whose underlying equity is not yet, yet appreciated, but nevertheless, in the investor's opinion, they think that the stock is likely to, to do so in the future. Convertibles that are not trading like the equity, they do provide the same protection against equity declines as other bonds. Uh, but remember that their coupons are going to be lower than what you get on other bonds. And so if equity prices don't in fact move up, then you've actually paid for an option that hasn't really benefited you. Um, you also need to be aware that convertibles can differ uh, in their features and provisions. So again, if you're buying these individual convertibles, it's really important that you read the bond indenture, which is the legal contract uh, that defines the terms and conditions of the bond so that you're fully aware of the specifics of specific features of your uh, individual bond. And you also need to be aware that convertible issuers tend not to be rated or they uh, maybe if they are rated, they carry a very low credit rating. And also be aware that convertible bonds are typically subordinated to other bonds. So because of those factors, um, analyzing the credit risk is really, really important. You should also be aware that the convertible bond market is pretty small. It's a niche market accounting for only a couple of percent of the total bond market. So the implication of that is that there may be very little liquidity if you're trying to get out of a bond, particularly during uh, you know, market extreme. 
Uh, and of course, as you'd expect, these convertible bonds, uh, because they're complicated, they require sophisticated analysis. Um, so because of all of these issues, I really don't recommend that you buy individual bonds. Most investors who want to get into this sector should really do so through an ETF or a mutual fund. But I do want to reiterate that convertibles, they really offer intriguing possibilities and they make for a very interesting and potentially exceedingly lucrative addition to your bond portfolio. They offer most of the upside of the equity market with significantly reduced downside volatility. Well, Brian, I appreciate you breaking down <clears throat> this incredibly niche um, but interesting topic. Um, before we go, where can people find you and your work? Well, you can find other articles that I've written for the AAII Journal on my author page, and you can find that by visiting the author index at aaii.com slash authors. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about convertible bonds, you can check out Brian's article that he mentioned earlier. It's called Inside Convertible Bonds, an Attractive Risk Slash Return Tradeoff. It's in the June 2021 AAII Journal issue. It's available both in print and on AAII.com. Thanks again, Brian. Thanks, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here with you again. Hi, all. If you weren't aware, we do record this show in advance of the broadcast date, and we do like to answer questions in our listener mailbag segment. We didn't receive any questions for this episode of the show in advance, so I just wanted to remind our viewers and listeners that you can do so. If you have questions for us for a future episode or an, on anything you have seen or read from AAII content, please send an email to, to my email, rreeh at aaii.com with the subject line, II show question. We will try to get it on air for the next episode. And now a word from our friends at Discover Bank, sponsor of the Individual Investor Show and AAII webinars. We know as individuals in interested in building investor wealth, you never want your money to be idle. Even small dollar amounts for short amounts of time should be working for you. With that, we're pleased to share information from our partner, Discover Bank, on deposit accounts that keep your money moving. You can choose from several options to help you meet your short-term or long-term financial goals. The best part? All of the deposit accounts offer preferred member rates. Please take a look. If you liked our show, please visit aaii.com slash webinars to register for more great webinar and video content. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at aaii underscore invest underscore ed. For more investing education, check out our website, aaii.com. I want to thank our guests, Charles Ropla, John Bukowski, and Brian Hawhey, as well as my co-host, Kyla Wirth. And of course, you for listening. We'll see you next time.